Writing dialogue is something that I struggle with. Dialogue is hard. You could almost say dialogue is coming close. Complicated. Hard to make it sound natural, to give it depth, to make every character sound different, but not so different that they're a gimmick, you know? And cheers to today's sponsor, me! I'm the sponsor now! <laughs> on Writing and World Building Volume 1 has sold over 35,000 copies already. But you know what's even better than Volume 1? Volume 2, Electric Boogaloo, and it's out now. Link below. This book is a codified version of all of the writing and world building discussions we've had since Volume 1. So that's fight scenes and creating world histories and flashbacks and redemption arcs, all of that. All brand new stuff. But not only is this way easier to study and reference than a bunch of videos is, but it's been rewritten and refined with over 12,000 words worth of exclusive extra detail and depth just in here. Just way more examples, way more analysis packed into this. If you have found my work, like today's video, helpful at all, then this is the way to support it. Links down below to the paperback and ebook, and the audiobook is coming really damn soon. You can buy it from Amazon, but if you hate Amazon, fear, you can buy it from a bunch of other places as well. And hopefully your local bookstore. You guys picked this cover and didn't it just turn out freaking stunning? I am in love with it. What's that you say? What do you mean it would make a fantastic Christmas present right now? Oh, who would have thought of that? <laughs> Part one, dialogue tags versus action tags. Well, Jim Jams, Professor, we're not going to use magic. Ron ejaculated, ejaculated loudly. loudly. Snap, ejaculated, ejaculated slughorn. slughorn. Understanding how to use dialogue tags is one of the easiest ways to improve the flow and sound of your dialogue. Let's have a look at how Ned Vizzini handles a conversation between a lot of people in It's Kind of a Funny Story. A boy, his mother, a doctor, a nurse, and a policeman. I know, I hold her back. Mrs. Gilner, she really needs to leave with the dog, the nurse says. She has a dog, dogs are against policy, Chris says. Just one second, Dr. Marmot says. We all look at him. All right, Mrs. Gilner. Since you're here, your son has checked himself in due to suicidal ideation and acute depression. You understand? Yes. He was on a Zoloft, but he stopped taking it. You did? Mum turns to me. I thought I was better, I shrug. Stubborn like your father. Yes, Doctor? Well, the next question is for Craig. Craig, would you like to be admitted? Yes, I say. Vizzini uses four dialogue tags, all said or say, but also replaces some dialogue tags with action tags. I hold her back and mum turns to me. These tell us who said the line and give a bit of movement and variety to the scene. Action tags can be really great replacements. Here, the action tags develop the important dynamics that Craig is uncomfortable with his mother's overbearingness and his mum's shock at him stopping his medication. Action tags also allow you to control the pacing a bit. If you want to slow an exchange down, or have the reader focus on one particular line, then having the characters move to a chair, or close the door behind them, or clean their glasses is a way to do that, give gravitas to a moment. Action beats can also help indicate the cadence or pacing of the line to follow as well. Yes, yes, of course, yes! Sydney waved his hands urgently. That's how I worked out this one! Reverse thermaturgy, yes, uh, certainly, uh, in time. Sydney waving his hands means that we read this line as someone speaking perhaps a little bit louder, faster, more desperately. They can help you show rather than tell. But, as always, there's a but, use them too much and it turns into this. Just one second, Dr. Marmo checked his notebook. We all looked to him. All right, Mrs. Gilner, you understand your son has checked himself in. He opened the window to let in some fresh air. Yes, his mother nodded anxiously. Mr. Marmot sat down at his desk. He was on his Zoloft, but he stopped taking it. Do you see how clunky that is? Here the characters are doing things, but they don't really mean anything. It adds variety, yeah, but the dialogue is slow, like it's constantly stopping and starting. Easily one of the most common pieces of advice I end up giving to people is to cut these action tags that don't really mean anything and just to let their characters talk. That too many action tags just lose their effect. So. When working action tags into your dialogue, maybe look for a few of those more important lines that develop the dynamics in your scene, where the scene ramps up in tension, or where something changes. You can even slip them into the middle of a line with M dashes in between, to create a sense that someone is doing something at the same time as they are speaking. But what about dialogue tags? Said, shouted, 
burst, cried, growled, ejaculated. <laughs> oh, that was written in one of the highest selling books of all time. Twice. <laughs> One, said is the most important dialogue tag you have and you're gonna be using it a hell of a lot more than all of the rest of them and here is why. When we look at how said is used in It's Kind of a Funny Story, you can see it's mostly used for clarity, when characters are conversing in quick succession, when there's a lot of them, marking when new characters jump in. Said isn't really telling us how they are talking exactly, just who is talking. It operates more like grammar to speech than words that you actually read. Two, people advise against using said bookisms like yelled and swore and growled because the word said encompasses a lot of the different ways that we say things now. That's why answered and replied and queried and commented so often read clunky. They're placeholder dialogue tags, easy words that you can cut or replace because they're doing the same thing as said but uh, just worse and they get the reader to snag on what you really mean. We infer how things are said from the context, the dialogue itself, and grammar like an exclamation mark. Because of this, characters who are constantly chirping and growling and muttering can sound melodramatic. One of the easy tells is that I'll be reading dialogue and I won't really believe it because these words are indicating that the lines are being said with way more intensity than the author probably intends. And then there's three. Sometimes what you're trying to do is better accomplished with an action tag. For example, please just let them go. Take me instead, Graham Begged. Versus, please just let them go. Take me instead. Graham moved between the officer and the door, tears in his eyes. It's just so much stronger, isn't it? But the question remains, does it not? When do you use these fancy words like murmured and swore and ejaculated? <laughs> The answer is never, never use ejaculated. <laughs> but no, they are still very useful. For a rough idea, I went through the first 100 dialogue tags of Stephen King's The Mist and Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn, both of whom are prolific modern authors. And I found that about 10 to 15% of their tags were other words. Though I do want to mention that a lot of those were asked. And when I went back to my book and had a look, I found that I had about 30%, which is probably a bit too high. So I cut those back and it was a really easy way to improve my dialogue. One of the ways you can use these other dialogue tags is to give information that's not immediately apparent in the dialogue itself. She started to sniffle again and he put a fatherly arm around her. She pulled in close, trying to use his warmth to push away the pain. I loved him, Kelsier, she whispered. Elend, I know. Whispered is just one of those sorts of words. It's just clarifying the tone. This passage from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo shows us another way to use these other tags. Larson uses the word gasped to mark a change in gear in the scene. Up until this point, the two characters have just been going back and forth using the word said. Until here, where the character Blancfist enrages the serial killer. The same thing happens a couple of pages later when the tension ramps up again with the arrival of Salander. No, run, he croaked. Here these other words are being used to mark the tension ramping up or down, but I've also seen these words used a lot to mark an emotional shift in the scene, from anger to sadness, or sadness to happiness, or neutral to some other emotion. But sometimes they're just a shorthand way of indicating intensity, or cadence, or sarcasm, or emotion, or contrasting two characters when you don't want to spend too many words on it, and that's okay. Show don't tell is a generally helpful if nebulous tip, but when it comes to dialogue tags, not everything can or should come out in posture and expression, and constant action tags can be really grating and tedious. Sometimes showing with these words is just more efficient, and this is easily the most common reason people use these words. Now, it's gonna take practice to figure out where that line is for your work. I can't tell you exactly, but it's like salt. A little helps, but you don't want it to only taste of salt. And speaking of things that I am salty about, part two, let your damn characters talk. I read pieces all the time where the author just refuses to let characters talk for more than a couple of lines at a time without a tag or prose or an action beat, and it is so annoying. Once Vizini establishes that it's Dr. Mahmoud and Mrs. Gilner speaking, they go back and forth for a couple of lines. No dialogue, no action tags at all. 
Some people are afraid to do this because, I don't know, they, they think the reader won't be able to follow or that they need action for the scene to be interesting, but that is just not the case, please. In the Northern Lights, Philip Pullman has Lyra and the Professor going back and forth for three pages with only five dialogue tags and only two real action tags. The girl with the dragon tattoo has 500 words at a time with only a couple in the mix. That's because they trust me to follow what's happening and they let me get immersed in the dialogue and I love that. Constantly interrupting makes it slow and takes me out of the conversation. So hear me out, a really easy way to improve your dialogue scenes to make them faster and smoother is to take out those constant interruptions that don't really matter and don't add much and just let the characters talk. So please. Stop ejaculating at me. Make sure it's clear, but let the characters talk. However, as always, doing this too much can lead to another problem, talking heads, which is where the reader has no idea what to visualize as characters are talking. This is also one reason that people typically say that you shouldn't start your novel with a line of dialogue. It's why it's really important to set the scene beforehand, as Pullman and Larson do before a dialogue heavy scene especially establishing the things that characters will interact with later on as they talk, creating a continuity to the physical space in the conversation, and sprinkling in some action beats to physicalize what they're really saying. That helps. So you should be getting the impression that it's a balancing act. All of this will just tighten up your dialogue. It'll flow better and sound better, and it's relatively easy to do. Now the hard part of dialogue is something else. It's part three character voice and making characters sound different. How do you get your characters to sound like different people? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. One character uses Sid and the other character uses Ejacula. This was one problem that came up during my beta reading that all my characters sounded a little bit too similar or too much like me. They didn't have distinct character voices. Writing advice around character voice talks a lot about how people say things, word choice and syntax and accents. But what really helped me was thinking about the role characters play in a dialogue scene and the focus of their dialogue. Have a listen to Tyrion Lannister here. Singer, Tyrion said, turning to Marillion, when you make a ballad of this, be certain you tell them how Lady Arryn denied the dwarf the right to a champion and sent him forth lame and bruised and hobbling to face her finest knight. You're asking a lame man to teach a cripple how to dance, Tyrion said. However sincere the lesson, the result is likely to be grotesque. When talking about something, Tyrion Lannister focuses on the cruelties of others and how humiliating something might be for someone, how it affects the outcasts, because he is familiar with cruelty and is an outcast of sorts. He's got the same education, vocabulary, class, syntax, and accent as, say, Tywin Lannister, but he has a totally different character voice because of that focus. Tywin Lannister would have focused on the damage done to the Lannister name. If you want just a great example of this kind of character voice, I recommend checking out Torchwood. It's an adult sci-fi show about a specialist group dealing with alien technology and their intense bisexuality. And I was shocked with how well they did all of this kind of thing. It's just a great show, okay? When I looked at my writing, part of the reason my characters sounded similar was that they all approached discussions from kinda the same angle, mirroring each other's points and concerns, especially in scenes where they weren't in direct conflict. When I made my characters approach the same discussion from different angles, even just slightly, by giving them a different aspect to focus on in line with their character, their different character voices really came out. The pessimist might focus on the dangers, the overconfident character will gloss over their weaknesses and focus on their strengths. So instead of thinking about a scene as my characters talk about this thing, I divided up those concerns and points or invented new ones to give each character a different angle to approach the discussion from. So they each bring something unique to the conversation, sharpening those little differences between them. It doesn't need to be confrontational and it can be really subtle, but say giving each character a specific piece of information that only they would notice or a unique way of framing the thing that only they would see it as can be really effective. Let's look at an example from Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation after the characters find a strange alien writing on the wall. I'm just using the dialogue here because the prose isn't that important. Biologist. Some sort of fungi. The letters here are made from fruiting bodies. Surveyor. Words. Made of fungi? Anthropologist. 
There is no recorded human language that uses this method of writing. Is there any animal that communicates this way? Biologist. No. There is no animal that communicates this way. Surveyor. Are you joking? This has to be a joke, right? Biologist. Fruiting bodies. Forming words. The biologist focuses on how strange the role of fruiting bodies is, while the surveyor, someone who isn't quite a believer that all of this weird stuff is happening, focuses on how this might signal intense danger for them. Meanwhile, the anthropologist, a more solution-focused character, focuses on reasoning how this might have come to be, contrasting with the biologist's just simple curiosity. The biologist now could have reasonably said it would have made perfect sense if they said, it's some sort of fungi. I can't think of any animal that writes like this. It can't be a good sign, can it? But Vandermeer didn't do that. He divided up these focuses amongst the characters with whatever fit them most, giving them more distinct character voices by giving them each a role to play in the scene with a different way to frame what they're talking about. I really like looking at focus because it imbues dialogue with that really important kind of character subtext, our needs and wants, our strengths and weaknesses, way more than say word choice does, which a lot of people focus on when creating character voice. What we look at and focus on is a lot more indicative of our internal world and thus gives us a stronger character voice. And this is all pretty closely connected to the role they play in dialogue. Think about the X-Files. Scully is the skeptic about the aliens and all these weird happenings, while Mulder is the believer, the conspiracy theorist, the wild thinker. The writers could have had Mulder and Scully both be skeptical or both be believers. But their dialogue really comes alive because they play such distinct different roles in their scenes together. The pessimist might focus on the dangers the characters are going to encounter. The overconfident character will gloss over their weaknesses and focus on their strengths. Now at the same time, don't let this get tropey where characters are forced to only have one attitude to things. You know, the big tough guy goes, wanna smash and only thinks about brute force at every opportunity. But having them take on broadly different roles will inform their focus and give them a different voice. But what about all of the other stuff? You know, our class and sex and age and accent and education, all of those things will impact our character voice. The words and expressions we use, our syntax, how long we take to express things, how forceful or restrained or poetic we are, how much we listen or speak over others. An upper class person might always use their manners. A child is more likely to get distracted as they speak. House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski is a perfectly normal book with absolutely nothing disconcerting about it. And it has great character writing on this level. Have a listen. I'm possessed by an eerie presentiment that all is not well. Was it your leaving that seemed to offer up a discordant note? The way you turned your back on your mother, and not only looked back twice, not that twice shouldn't have been more than enough, after all once was too much for Orpheus, but your looking seemed to signal in my heart some message of mortal wrong. This frat boy, swaying back and forth before me like an idiot, raises his axe even higher above his head. His plan, I see, is not too complicated. He intends to drive that heavy blade into my skull, across the bridge of my nose, cleave the roof of my mouth, the core of my brain, split apart the vertebrae in my neck, and he won't stop there either. Look at how much we know about these people just from how they talk. The mother's word choice tells us she's educated, possibly upper class, likely a fair bit older. She clearly overthinks as well. The term mother rather than mum makes her seem overly composed, maybe a little distant. In the second though, the language is kind of plain, gritty and relatively simple. He's a straightforward man, smart but not too pretentious. The term frat boy is also derogatory, telling us he's probably a bit older. But there is actually a more important element underneath all of this, all the stuff we've been discussing, and that is contrast between characters. With House of Leaves and Annihilation and the point of focus, it's the contrast between the characters that makes their character voices so distinct, just as much as the language itself. So here are five things to keep in mind when you want to contrast your characters. Number one. Speaking patterns. In Avatar The Last Airbender, Aang will often make callbacks and comparisons to the past when reasoning things through. Sokka often falls into lecture mode where he will bring in details that slowly build up before he reveals a plan or an invention because he likes to show his reasoning before his solution. 
Toph, however, speaks in short sentences compared to Katara. She is very to the point, very blunt, whereas Katara tiptoes a little bit more around how others are feeling. Two how they present information. This will change from scene to scene because it's very tied to their emotions, but keep in mind who could be speaking emotively versus sticking to the cold hard facts. Phrasing things as definites and certainties versus using a lot of maybes and mights and if it's okay. Rambling versus pointed language. These will obviously create contrast between characters. Three, word choice. Yep. Absolutely, it does matter. In The Great Gatsby, Gatsby is the only character to use the term old sport, all to give the impression that he's aristocratic, born to old money and an upper class background. My girlfriend was telling me the other day that I use the words notorious and fundamentally all the time and that nobody else in her life does. Because you see, fundamentally, I'm a bit notorious for that. It's probably because I like being academic, I have a law degree, and they like fancy words there. But it does make me sound distinct, doesn't it? Consider giving characters words or phrases that only they use every so often, and it doesn't need to be extreme or it can be a bit gimmicky where they're using the same catchphrase every single line like a character from a video game. To be honest, Gatsby's pretty close to that at times. But lastly, different metaphors and comparisons. Let's look at this line again from Annihilation. The surveyor spoke. In this case, I feel that we should rule out the tunnel as something invasive or threatening before we explore further. It's like an enemy at our backs otherwise, if we press forward. The surveyor has a military background and approaches this discussion by framing it in these military terms. The other characters are scientists and will often draw metaphors and comparisons that come from their discipline, biology, psychology, or anthropology. They all use technical language, so in that way, they're actually all quite similar, but this contrast makes them distinct again. Five, contrast how their dialogue looks on the page. This is a really easy visual cue that just sits in the back of the reader's mind. Not just how they talk, but who interrupts more, who speaks for short periods versus long periods, who has to have the last word in a conversation, who dominates the conversation, who takes a back seat. Now, I wanna be clear, you do not need to contrast in everything. But contrasting a few of these things in dialogue scenes will really help sharpen those differences between them as people. Uh, but, again, but, here is the trippy thing. Part four, it is okay if characters sound the same sometimes. I have read way too many examples where characters are just a caricature of contrast, especially where accents get involved. Hello there, McDougal. Would you like to go to cafe, get coffee? Ach no, laddie, I have to go down to the pub. Well, they're clearly different characters. The whole advice, you should be able to remove dialogue tags and still tell who is speaking, is only, uh, sometimes helpful. Yes, you want them to sound different, and sometimes that will be the case, but a lot of what we say can be said by a lot of people, and that's okay. That's why I prefer to look at focus in dialogue, because people can sound similar and use similar words, but it's still clearly one character or another. The golden rule is really this. Not every piece of dialogue needs to sound like it could have only come from one character, but every character needs some dialogue that only sounds like them. Part five, realistic dialogue. This is a rabbit hole to go down, but here we go. You've probably heard, listen to real people talk. But, 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 but what does that even mean? Everyone talks differently, especially fictional people, I ejaculate in protest. Dialogue in real life is full of pointless tangents and comparisons and dead ends, but fictional dialogue always has a point. So instead, you are creating the illusion of realism. A neat way to help with this is to let the dialogue be a little bit out of order. Let me explain. When we're talking, we don't perfectly follow on from what others are saying a lot of the time because we focus on different things. We don't respond directly and we rephrase the conversation in our turns. We introduce other concerns and that makes the conversation just a little bit out of step. We'll often go and then address whatever they said before, but sometimes it'll be a bit round about getting there. Let's have a look at that bit from Annihilation again. Biologist. Some sort of fungi. The letters here are made from fruiting bodies. Surveyor? Words? Made of fungi? Anthropologist. 
There is no recorded human language that uses this method of writing. Is there any animal that communicates this way? Biologist. No. There is no animal that communicates this way. Surveyor. Are you joking? This has to be a joke, right? Biologist. Fruiting bodies. Forming words. They're all talking about the fungus writing, but on three slightly different conversational threads. The biologist frames it as a weird natural phenomena, while the anthropologist frames it as outside of human civilization. Meanwhile, the surveyor is focused on how disconcerting or even dangerous this is. The biologist does directly respond to the anthropologist, but not the surveyor, whose thread goes unanswered until later, and none of them respond to the biologist thread until a little bit later as well. These conversational threads are developing, but a little out of order, a little out of sync. Now, imagine if it were written like this. Anthropologist. It's some sort of fungi. Biologist. Yes, the letters are made from fruiting bodies, forming words. Anthropologist. Is there any animal that communicates this way? Biologist. No, there is no animal that communicates this way. Anthropologist. There is no recorded human language that uses this method of writing either. Biologist. Then who wrote this? Surveyor. Are you joking? This is a joke, right? Biologist. I don't think so. Anthropologist. Not after everything we've seen. Here, a thread is introduced, it's addressed, and then a new thread is introduced. It's not, uh, terrible, but it feels a little more stilted because everything is perfectly in order. It all sounds a little mechanical, so maybe jumble up your dialogue threads a bit. People reacting to some, but not others, making assertions of their own before responding to what was said before, remarking something to themselves, in their own world. It helps it feel, realistically, a little out of step as the conversation progresses. Another thing is that people don't really talk in grammatically correct ways. Yes. Half sentences, run on sentences, often cutting off the beginning or end, just saying the core bit. The biologist says, fruiting bodies, forming words. And that's because that's how her thought process sounds, just these fragments. Especially in more casual settings. We tend to speak in full sentences when we want to be understood or heard, when we want to take control of a situation, when we want to be more professional. But that flexibility with our syntax and grammar is very human in dialogue. Part 6. Dialogue versus Summarizing You do not need to write out every single exchange that a character has in your book in the same way that you don't need to write out every single move that your character makes. Luckily, Novels can do something that plays and films cannot do nearly as easily. We can summarize. A call from my mum a few weeks later reminded me just how far from home I was. She talked about her blooming chrysanthemums, that she had learned to play Debussy's Claire de Lune on the piano, and that Danny was following in my footsteps and excelling in math and physics. The weather had been hot, the days long, and the flowers, leaves, and trees had all come out in company. William was out of the picture, but she was brighter with every note. Yet as I listened to mum telling me about all the things that had changed, it was apparent how much had remained the same too. She was a better person than me. Hey mum, I said as she went to end the call. Yes? I love you. A fleeting pause tagged the end of the sentence. I love you too, James. I realised she had been waiting for her, but silence is the sound of something said far too rarely. And I actually wrote that passage. I've been trying to force myself to share more of my writing with you, but that is from my fiction book, which I've been taking to agents. And I'm stoked to that because I've sent it off to about 10 so far and it's been a major goal of mine this year. Anyways, so here are three things that you might summarize. One, my character here is telling his mum that he loves her. It's an important story beat for him, but I didn't want the mum to feature personally in the story too much, and I didn't want to spend too much time basically writing out small talk, which is kind of boring to read. So instead, I summarized the feeling and flow of the conversation to give the reader a sense of what it was like, and I only used dialogue to lay out this really important moment at the end. It doesn't feel out of place. But secondly, you might also summarize filler dialogue. Sometimes authors will need to have a few different conversations in a particular scene, and then we'll try to awkwardly segue between them with some boring small talk or banter between the characters, and it is super noticeable. <laughs> 
But what if instead you broke up those conversations by summarizing the flow and feel of the conversation for a bit, and then cut back in with the interesting dialogue that we actually care about? Three, enter late, leave early. Basically, what this means is leave out all the boring stuff at the start and end of a dialogue scene. Ever wondered why nobody says hello and just hangs up the phone without saying goodbye in films? This is why! The sky was lighter already. There was a faint, fresh stir in the air. What's that you've got? Said Mrs. Lonsdale, closing the battered little suitcase with a snap. The master gave it to me. Can't it go in the suitcase? Too late, I'm not opening it up now. It'll have to go in your coat pocket, whatever it is. Hurry on down to the buttery, don't keep them waiting. It was only after she had said goodbye to the few servants who were up, and to Mrs. Lonsdale, that she remembered Roger, and she felt guilty for not having thought of him once since meeting Mrs. Coulter. Here, Pullman cuts into the conversation with Mrs. Lonsdale without any pleasantries, and leaves it just summarizing the goodbyes. I've also linked a rule of Ratnikar's novella Submergence down below, which you can read for free, because she strikes this balance fantastically. Every single line is super important, and she knows when to summarize, when to enter, and when to leave. In books, people kind of assume that characters say hello and goodbye and do the small talk. An easy way to tidy up your dialogue then is to get rid of these pleasantries and summarize outside of the core point of the dialogue scene. It also allows you to keep up the pace and focus on the point of the conversation, the drama that we're interested in, like the alethiometer that Lyra has just been given. But sometimes you want to do small talk. I have a scene in my book where two characters are refusing to talk about a serious issue they have with each other. But then they bump into each other. I laid out all of the small talk because I wanted the reader to feel that awkward space where the characters aren't really saying anything because they're avoiding talking about the things that really matter. Now, if you've found this video helpful or my work more broadly helpful, then I really recommend picking up On Writing and World Building Volume 2. It is written for you. And you can get Volume 1 super cheap right now if you want as well. And once you've got a copy, write a review on Amazon. I cannot understate how important reviews are. Once this got a bunch of them, it kicked it into another gear and is now selling all on its own, really. Thank you. Links down below, or just chuck them on your Christmas list. But really, thank you. Because these were only made possible with you, and they're for you. Oh, you're just the most beautiful, sexy book in the world. He ejaculated. <clears throat> it's, it's purely professional. But let me just bring this all together, and I promise to speak calmly, I will not ejaculate. Summary. Action tags can replace dialogue tags, add more variety, indicate cadence, or which lines are important, and allow you to control the pacing of a scene, but too many of them can be really clunky. Said encompasses a lot of different ways of saying things, which is why using other words too much can sound melodramatic. Look to replace placeholder dialogue tags like replied and those that indicate a line is more intense than you truly want it to be. Sometimes action tags better accomplish the same thing. Three. However, other tags can still be a great shorthand way of indicating intensity, cadence, or emotion when you don't want to spend too many words. They can mark when the scene changes gear, intention, or emotion, or they can give information that's just not immediately apparent in the dialogue. 4. Let characters talk for God's sake, but don't let them become talking heads. 5. Allowing each character to approach the same topic from a different angle with a different aspect to focus on helps develop their character voice. It also infuses their dialogue with more character subtext. 6. Contrast is just as important, not in every way, but in some. Speaking patterns, how they present information, word choice, expressions, the comparisons and metaphors they use, and how their dialogue looks on the page. 7. Not every piece of dialogue needs to sound like it could only come from one character, but every character needs some dialogue that only sounds like them. And eight, realistic dialogue is flexible in its syntax and grammar, especially in casual settings, and often has conversation threads moving a little bit out of step. I guess that's it. I hope you guys liked this video. Stay nerdy, and I'll see you in the future. Get the book. Blah, 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 get the book. Get it all. Go buy the book. Do it. You know you want it. Put it on your Christmas list. Get it. Blah. This book is a cod. So all, br so all brand, so all brand new stuff. All brand new stuff. All brand new stuff. All brand new stuff. <sighs> How am I spending half an hour doing this? This is a whole rabbit. This is a whole. This is a rabbit. This is a whole. 
This is a whole rabbit. This is a whole rabbit hole down, but here we go. 